Class is now in session. Welcome back. If this is your first time, welcome. We are going to be discussing a whole life insurance contract. We're going to be looking at the performance of a whole life insurance policy versus a 30 year treasury bond. Now, full transparency. If I make any mistakes here, please point them out. If you feel that my numbers are off, please comment below what you think it should have been or if you would make a tweak here so that we can have a, a very good comparison. And my goal in this video is to not sell you in one direction or the other, but rather just help you make a better decision if you're looking at these different types of financial products and services. So this is gonna be a series of videos where we make really good solid comparisons of different financial instruments as it relates to where can you save your money and, and get the most efficient use of those savings dollars. So we're specifically looking at how you save money, the question of how can we save money better. What we're not gonna do is I'm not going to be comparing a savings vehicle or savings asset and comparing it to an investment. And the, the key thing that I'm gonna draw a line in to determine whether something is a savings vehicle or an investment is if the tool itself has the ability to lose money, not from inflation or taxes, but simply if I put money in here and then it compounds and then that investment is, or, or that tool is tied to something that could affect the performance of the account to the point where it could produce a negative return, then I'm gonna disqualify that, right? So for example, I'm not gonna compare a whole life insurance contract to a brokerage account or Roth IRA or an IRA or 401k. Why? Because my simple argument would be why not have both? Why not save money and invest money? Okay, so that's where I'm coming from. If you disagree with that, I had a wonderful conversation, dialogue, slight debate with a gentleman by the name of Todd. And Todd believes in combining all his available cash flow and throwing it towards investing. So he's a, he's a person that does not save money. He simply invests every single dollar, is looking to multiply it, and is willing to take the risk of potentially losing dollars. The upside is much greater return. If you have a strategy in your finance, in your personal finances, where you save money, that money that I'm putting towards savings, I'm intending not to lose a single dollar. I may not have a high upside, but there is no ability of me losing money from the tool itself. Inflation tax is different, right? Because that would affect that would affect both parties. Um, but if we're specifically looking at savings dollars, the tool itself can't lose money, in my opinion, can't lose money. All right. So with that being said, we're going to take this video and we're just going to look at a whole life insurance contract versus a 30 year treasury bond. Right. So let me give you the, the details. I'm showing an individual at 24 years old saving $10,000 per year in, in lump sum, right? In a lump sum, adding $10,000 per year. Principal amount over a 30 year period. So I'm looking over a 30 year period, allocating $10,000 per year over a 30 year period. Principal dollar amount, 300K, starting at 24 years old. On this side, I'm showing whole life insurance. On this side, I'm, I'm showing a 30 year treasury bond. Now, full transparency. I've never bought a bond before. So I've done some Google research so far to gather some data. What I'm not fully aware of, or if it's possible, is how you contribute funds to a treasury bond. Is it one time or do I have the ability to add to it uh, as much money as I want or is it a set amount per year? Those are things I, I don't know just yet. So what I showed was paying 10,000 contributing 10,000 per year in one shot on an annual basis on a 30 year treasury bond and the same for a whole life insurance contract. So not 10,000 divvied up over 12 payments on a monthly or a semi it's one shot each time. And then that money is compounding. These two rates that I pulled from the treasury uh, was from Google. And I said, I Googled, what is the average rate of return on a 30 year treasury bond? And these were the two numbers that popped up the most across a bunch of different sites. So I showed earning a 4.59% fixed rate of return over 30 years, and then a 4.75% rate of return. If you disagree with these numbers, comment below. If you think it should be lower, let me know. If you think it should be higher, 
let me know and then give your reasons why um, don't put any links in the comments because it won't nothing it won't pop up it'll automatically delete it it's the way i have on my on my youtube channel but you can put the source in terms of where you research you you know tell me google this search this site you know but don't put it as a link right put a space and that'll really give myself and all of us together to really help us make uh, better decisions with our finances and also do really good analysis and, and comparison in terms of what the what the performance is and we're looking at a lot of different factors as well so over a 30-year period funding ten thousand per year i put in the uh, compound interest calculator this is what the number came out was six hundred nineteen thousand four fifty seven at the four point nine percent and then at 4.75 it's 636,559 the only number i minused was federal income tax on the the treasury i used these two numbers if you disagree with these numbers let me know put in the comments should it be lower should it be higher i'm going off history and 2023 numbers and so i would assume this is a very very super underestimated tax rate it will most likely be much higher 30 years from now because taxes typically go up so i used 12.42 percent and 15 percent 15 percent was my guess 12.42 was a google search and that was the number that i got and so i times that off of the total interest gained over a 30 year period 319 and 336 so basically your money doubled all right over a 30 year period at this rate of return so if you minus from the 12.42 percent or 15 percent you would have an, a net right of 294 to 286 or 277 to 268 which would leave us with anywhere these this, these numbers right here would be the total so i'm adding the principal and interest minus taxes so it'd be anywhere from as high as 594 as low as 577 those are the numbers if you disagree with that comment below tell me why what number did you use here what number did you use for taxes be very very detailed in your comment put spaces put everything right and this will really really help everyone uh, that's trying to learn right and again there's no selling being done in this video it's purely like how are we looking at this? What is the total value, total performance of each of these tools? So now looking at a whole life insurance contract, same thing, funding 10,000 per year on an annual basis. The end result, cash value, because there's two elements in a whole life insurance contract. You have a living benefit and you have a death benefit. So the living benefit is referring to the cash value. This would be the rate of return that we're earning inside of a whole life insurance contract that rate of return can fluctuate so it is not a fixed return there is a guaranteed fixed rate or guaranteed fixed dividend which could be as low as two percent or as high as 3.75 percent depending on which life insurance company we go with in this example i used mass mutual as my uh, as the company right so if you want me to use a different company or if you have a recommendation, we can throw that in there, right? So I used Mass Mutual, and right now I want to say their guaranteed rate is no less than 3%. So I think it might be a little bit over 3 right? You, someone in here could correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's above or right at 3%. Now, Mass Mutual, as of 2023, their gross dividend rate, I believe, is right around this number, anywhere from 6 to six point. 1%. So in the first year of dumping $10,000 in, I'm showing a cash value of 9,135 with a death benefit of $375,421. And then 30 years later, cash value grows to $599,477 and the death benefit also increased from 375 all the way up to $1.4 million. So $1,441,000. $925. With the whole life insurance contract, there is no tax that would get reduced from this total return here, right? So if we use a whole life insurance properly, not improperly, what do I mean by that? If we pull money from the 599 to use, right? Because at 30 years, this, this money would mature and then we would have access to it. That's what I'm assuming here, right? So I had access to this money and then I can distribute it and invest it again 
reinvest it or take it as income, right? And at that point, you would have a taxable expense, right? Over the years of you withdrawing the funds and then you're reporting that on your taxes. Over here, if I take loans, right? If I do loans, say three to 4%, right? Could be as high as five, right? Just depends on what the insurance company uh, allows for or is at the time. What I do know is after owning a whole life insurance policy, by the time you hit age 65 or have owned the policy for 20 years, whichever comes last, the loan interest rate actually reduces from the time of you starting the policy. So that's why I'm showing that three to four rate. In the beginning, it's probably around there, 5%. If I borrow from this 599 as income, I can use that money tax-free so I don't have to worry about an additional expense. The only expense that is within the whole life insurance contract is the cost of insurance, the death benefit, or something called a premium, right? In this example, I showed a base premium, I think of $1,000, right? And then there's also PUA charges that come with the, the cost of insurance as well as so three different uh, charges. In a 30-year treasury, from what I Googled, there are no fees to have a 30-year treasury bond. So no fees whatsoever from what I researched. If I'm wrong, correct me. So the only cost here would be the taxes, right? Inflation affects both, right? So I'm not gonna you know, run that, but when it comes to taxes, that would be the, the difference. This one has a taxable event, this one does not if we use it properly and if we design the policy properly to not uh, create a mech at any point in time of funding this policy. The other thing is while funding the whole life insurance contract versus a 30 year treasury bond, you have liquidity, meaning I dump in 10,000 year one, I can borrow a percentage of what I have in cash value. Usually it's around up to 90% is what I can borrow out of the available cash value and action, I, I can actually go and do something with that money. So if I had an emergency, I can pull from here. And the compound interest would not be interrupted. So compound interest, not interrupted, right? Which is really cool. Whereas in a 30 year treasury bond, if I withdraw from it, I'm wondering, I don't know, maybe there's a fee for that, maybe. Let's say there isn't a fee and I withdraw from it, I now interrupt the compound interest effect on here. Versus on here, my cash value would still be the same. So let's say I borrowed money every single year over a 30 year period, my cash value would still be the same. Granted, I keep funding 10,000 a year. I would still have that net number of 599, 477, with loans of two, three, four hundred grand, and I would be paying an interest rate. That interest rate that I would pay per year would only be affected, or I should say this, if I borrow money against this cash value and I use the cash value to pay the loan interest, then, then this number would be different. But if I borrowed in the first year $7,000 at 5% and then did not pay this back over the 30 year period, then every single year I would be paying $350 in interest, right? Granted, that loan interest stays the same. So if I pay $350 every single year out of pocket, that would mean that I'd be paying $10,000 plus I'm paying $350. So $350 over 30 years, that's $10,500. And if I keep funding $10K per year, again, this number will still result at $599,477. But if I have my cash value, pay the loan interest, then that will not be the correct number. And then that would be, in my opinion, improper use of this uh, type of account, this type of policy. So some of the pros, the advantages here, tax-free use, access and liquidity during the whole 30-year cycle. Over here, we can see that you net more money, right? You get a higher return, 636,000 or 619 versus 599. But then you minus taxes, it's really a little bit less, right? So 594 being the highest or 577 being or 568 being the lowest. So you get to make that decision. Do I value maybe a higher return more than this, All right? Because this rate, 6, 6.1%, 6 that's a gross rate. So don't get distracted, uh, don't get confused. That, oh, well, Denzel, that, that's a higher rate of return. So that's higher than this. Not really. For the first like almost five to eight years, you're earning actually a negative rate of return, right? Because you put in 10, now you have 9,135. So you're going to be at a negative for 
a nice three, four, five years on average. Then you start producing a positive. And I would say really after, after about 10 years is when you start to earn about a three to 4% internal net rate of return after expenses, after costs. You get to draw that comparison. Do I want a, a lower rate here, but it's guaranteed? Do I want maybe a higher rate here and I'll get a higher return and I'll deal with the taxes later? Or do I want to go with a, a potentially a lower internal rate of return here? No taxes ever. I retain liquidity, tax-free growth, tax-free use of the cash value. And not to mention, right, we totally left out this other benefit, which is the death benefit. I start out at 375,421, and by the time I'm 54, 53, 54 years old, I have a death benefit of $1.4 million. If, if you, at age 54, let's say you took out all this money, right, as a loan, right? Let's say, let's say you took out $550,000 at once, and the loan rate was 5%. So you're going to pay $27,500 on that money and you got 550 grand. And let's say you go and blow it. Well, if you were to minus, I, the number I used here was 1.441 million 925 minus 599,477. And you're left with 842,448. So let's say you, you took all this money out, blew it, and then died the, the day after, right? You spent all you spent a five hundred fifty thousand dollars in one day, blew it, went had a blast, right? And then you passed away. Your family would still receive eight hundred and forty two thousand four hundred forty eight dollars, completely tax free. That is another factor that you want to uh, decide in your decision when you're looking at where can I store savings dollars? Well, what's the most efficient way for me to grow my money safely where I won't lose a penny? Both options, you don't lose a penny. So that's that's important. Other examples I wrote here was savings account, money market, and CDs, right? The rates will change, but you're guaranteed not to lose money by just having it there. Now, obviously, if you factor in inflation, yes, you lose money, but that's with both, right? So we're not looking at, we're just counting that right now. We're just looking at what does the tool produce itself? So that's something you want to keep in mind. Say, oh, I have this living benefit and I have this death benefit. Anything happens to me, if I blow, use all that money while I lived, my family will still get a humongous, a humongous tax-free. Imagine giving your son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, imagine giving them a $842,000 dollar tax free head start on their life and then guess what they could acquire both of these at the same exact time and see which one performs the best because obviously this is just illustrations these are assumptions but now they don't have to choose like you had to choose with the little money that you did have and you're trying to decide what to do with those funds so if you're thinking really really long term you might value this or if you're like hey you know this sounds a little too confusing all right Maybe this is less confusing. Do some Google research. Let me know your thoughts. Please comment below what you think about that in terms of the, the numbers I laid out, the rates of returns. Which one do you value most? Which one are you going to go with? Or, or if you're in the situation and you're deciding, I would do this for yourself. Map out what paying into a savings account would look like over 30 years. Map out what it would look like contributing to a CD over 30 years, a money market over 30 years, right? But if you're going to compare me putting in 10,000 into a whole life insurance contract versus putting 10,000 into crypto or 10,000 into a brokerage account, you're not doing a proper apples to apples comparison, right? It's more like apples to oranges because you're comparing a savings vehicle, savings protection asset to an investment that has higher upside potential and risk, risk of loss. Right. With that being said, my name is Denzel Rodriguez, personal finance geek of the 21st century. I will be laying out a video series analyzing each and every option here and then based on your feedback your insight your thoughts we can compare it to other vehicles right if you absolutely want me to compare it to a, a 401k or a roth ira we can absolutely do that if that's what you want and we can see and i i already know that more than likely the 401k will probably outperform the whole life but then we could look at what's the total value we could look at the total value combining the death benefit and the cash value because a lot of people get mixed up they think that oh uh, Denzel what happens to the cash value when I when I die does my family get the 1.441925 and the 599 
The answer would be no. And if you looked at it this way, you started here, you started there, 375. Your cash value purchased more death benefit. So is it safe to say over a 30 year period, my cash value became the death benefit? Is that the proper thing to say here? Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that is that proper to say that the cash value over a 30 year period, if I design it correctly, where the death benefit increases year over year as the cash value increases year over year, then the cash value became the death benefit. So that 599 is in the death benefit. So I'm not going to get the 1.4 million and 599. I'm getting the 599 is in there. All right. If we look at, okay, what's the difference between 1,441,925 minus starting death benefit of 375,421. So there's a million dollar gap there. Where did that come from, right? If we really think about it, how did I go from 375 to 1.4 million? The answer is the cash value, the cash value growth. So you get to, you get a living benefit, but we can use that. And then when it's all said and done, and I pass away, my family gets to use the same money that I used while I was living. So if we look at principal dollars going in, what would be the total return if we look at the death benefit over a 30 year period after paying in 300 grand? So I get a 4.8 X potential return. So my money nearly 5 X. If we're looking at the death benefit, the money nearly 5 X over here at 2 X little over 2x over here nearly 5x and all of it's tax-free so great legacy planning tool and this is just looking at 10,000 bucks that's savings what if this person is saving 10 grand a year and investing 10,000 a year or more right I would recommend investing more than saving right like me personally I invest more money than I save right and then it's just a matter of well how are you investing right so I invest in things that I am looking to become a master in that I can dominate and control in that space. So for me, that's a business. So I invest in my business over six figures every single year. And then I also save a, about, about 30, 40 plus percent of my income is saved in whole life insurance. And I invest six figures, mul almost multiple six figures in my business to keep growing it. Uh, so hopefully this was really, really valuable to you as it is for me. And again, please look at all of the potential areas I might have I might have missed here or factors I'm not including right because I want to improve I want to make sure like as I'm helping my clients and as I'm helping myself that I'm making the right decision here I have a majority of people that I surround myself with are in full support of the things that I'm doing with my finances but I also like to spend just a little bit of time not too much time because these people can be too negative sometimes, but I do like to spend just a little bit of, of my time with people that do not agree with me, right? So AKA my, my haters, shout out to y'all, believe that I'm making a terrible financial mistake with my money. I like to spend just a little bit of time, see where they're coming from, see if their claims are based off emotion, lack of understanding, like they didn't do the proper research, like they clearly didn't do the math, or they clearly, you know, are believing another philosophy, right? Maybe buy term insurance, invest the difference, right? That's a philosophy. I choose not to follow that philosophy. But if you can pre present some, some real math to me or some results, tangible results, then that's, you know, more interesting. So with that being said, I'll cut it here. Have a wonderful day. God bless. And we'll be talking soon.